All right, everybody. It is one o'clock by my phone here, and I'm so glad you all can be here today. Um, as you all know, this is a continuation of our virtual field trip series with Appalachian Headwaters. Today, I'm super excited to give it over to Doug Wood, who is a wildlife biologist, formerly with the West Virginia DEP. He's also a master naturalist, and I would uh, put a few exclamation marks behind that because he really is pretty much the most knowledgeable naturalist I know in our West Virginia woods. Um, and this presentation is on West Virginia mammals, skin and bones. So I'm going to give it on over here to Doug. Hi, y'all. Okay, I'm going to get normal now. <laughs> That's pretty hard to do for me. You can ask uh, Kristen King. I see she's on the list there. <clears throat> I'm glad you're here. We're going to use the skulls and the skins of mammals today to learn a little something about them. And first, I want to give you a kind of a brief introduction to how many different mammal orders there are in West Virginia and how many mammal species we have and which ones are native and which ones are exotic. It'll be brief, I promise. Okay. I hope you can see the list there. Kevin, do you have any feedback? Can you tell if they can see that? I see some thumbs up yeah, coming. It looks good to around. me. Yeah, it looks great. Okay. okay. <clears throat> I'm looking at it too through my screen. All right. <clears throat> you can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven orders of mammals. That's the taxonomic order of mammals in the state. The uh, didelphomorphia. That's our possum. We have one species and it's native. And then we come down to insectivora. Think of the moles and the shrews, sort of mouse-like critters uh, that live close to the ground. We have a few of those. We have 11 native species. We don't have any exotics that we know of. Chiroptera, those are our bats. We have up to 14 now. The old list that you'll find on the DEP's old mammal brochure, I think, lists 13, but now they have uh, confirmed that the Seminole bat is actually uh, living in West Virginia and breeding in West Virginia. <clears throat> Rodentia, that's our largest order. 23 native, three non-native. You can guess which three are non-native. The house mouse, Norway rat, and the black rat. Legomorpha, those are our rabbits and hares, and we have three native species. Carnivora, we have 13 native species and two exotics. Those two exotics you may have around your house, dogs and cats, but we do have some feral dogs and feral cats in West Virginia. So they're on the, the wildlife list because of that. And then the Areodactyla. Those are our cloven hoofed animals. They have paired hooves. We have two natives in the state, white-tailed deer and elk, and elk have been restored. They were extirpated at one time from the state. And we have two exotics that in some places roam wild. We have some wild goats in West Virginia here and there scattered around, and we have some wild pigs in the southern part of the state, feral pigs and some Russian hogs that were stocked many years ago. So now we're gonna look at the skull table. <clears throat> I just wanna show you some of my collection and we'll be picking out individual skulls and looking at them. And then here we have my, my buddy and the skin table. So we'll look at a few of those as well. Now back to, back to my seating arrangement. <clears throat> That's the most exercise I've gotten all day because I've been in Zoom meetings all morning. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna start looking at our Artiodactyla, our uh, our even-toed ungulates. 
um, in the look at the skulls anyway. Actually, I think we'll we'll start out with the feet because they are even toed. Maybe you can think of of some animals that are considered ungulates. They eat a lot of grass and browse branches and what have you, and but they have odd toed hooves. Uh, big one is the horse. Uh, that's a in the Perissodactyla order, and we don't have any wild ones in West Virginia. There are some wild horses in this country, but not in West Virginia. So we see two hooves on each foot, and that's that tells us that we are in the Artiodactyla order with this example of uh, feet that I have here. One is a hind foot, one is a front foot. Uh, can you guess which is which? I'll leave that up to you. We can talk about it later if, if somebody wants to know how to distinguish. <clears throat> now, when a white-tailed deer is, is born, it's a pretty small thing. This one uh, was, it's, it's a yearling. Uh, it's, it looks large because I've got it in front of me, but it's a yearling. And I'll compare it with uh, a doe skull in size, you can see quite a bit of difference in size here. What I wanna really point out to you is so we have the skull, so this is the upper jaw. Notice there are no teeth holes in the, where, where incisors we would expect incisors to be. There are no holes for incisors to go into. So the deer doesn't have any incisors in the upper part of the jaw, but the lower jaw does have incisors. So the typical method of eating is to use the teeth of the lower jaw inside the lower jaw incisors to push a leaf against the plate of the upper jaw and then pick it off. It's usually a pretty neat, clean cut when they do that. <clears throat> And then here's the, back to the little one. The teeth here are made for grinding up vegetation. They're pretty even rough edges on them for grinding vegetation. You can see that they don't really have sharp points. They, have, uh, they do have points, but it's more like a serrated edge instead of a dagger-like configuration. And of course, the male deer, um, in its period when it's in rut, has antlers. These antlers grow annually. They drop off January, February, sometimes as late as March, and then they start growing again in uh, April, as early as April sometimes, typically June, and then they grow through the rest of the month, rest of the months until uh, October when their uh, the velvet comes off and they turn into hard bone. They're no longer living tissue at that point. <clears throat> Now let's say you went out into the woods and you found something like this. Is that a skull? It's not. There's no brain case back here. Is it a uh, a Norse, a Viking raider's mask? Well, it could be. <laughs> but this is the pelvis bone of a deer. And a lot of people see these in the woods and uh, they wonder, well, what did they come from? And here is the point where this is the ball joint where the ball of the femur rests inside the uh, socket of the pelvis. If you're walking in the woods and you see something like this, all you have to do is feel the back of your shoulder here because their shoulder blades are somewhat similar to ours. Flat, got a little kind of a ball joint here for the arm bone to slide into, and that's a um, when you see that, you know you've got the shoulder blade of an animal. Uh, and this size, compared to the size of my head, tells me this is an adult, a young adult deer. All right, let's move to the uh, carnivores. <clears throat> this is from, this is a bear, bear skulls, compared to the size of my head here. This was a a small bear, this could be an adult sow or could be a young boar um, bear, but they get much bigger. Let's look at the teeth, close up on the teeth. What do we call these teeth? Well, they're called canine teeth, and that's named after the family that um, 
dogs are in and wolves are in the canidae family. And uh, it's applied to almost all the carnivores. All carnivores have canine teeth and other animals have them as well. Very large teeth designed for uh, either killing, you know, by stabbing or hanging on to um, while trying to take down game. In the case of the bear, bears don't always hunt. Black bears don't always hunt, but sometimes they do. And when they need to hunt and take down a deer, they can do it. On the back of the jaw, towards the back, are these molars that are called carnassials. Now these things are designed for cracking bone. Um, they can do that. They're very strong, sturdy, very thick enamel, and they can crack bone. Those are called carnassials. <clears throat> One thing I want you to notice about this skull it has a pretty large brain case relative to um, the whole sh the whole size of the skull, and that's pretty typical of bears. They the assumption is because they have all that brain space, they're pretty smart animals. Well, you know that may or may not be true, but in the case of bears, it is that is the case. Now let's let's look at some other carnivores. We're going to compare these two. Both of them have canine teeth. Can you see those sharp dagger-like teeth? But let's compare the size of these skulls. All right. They're uh, not quite the same length, but they're about the same width. We get closer and we, and we turn them this way. Let's look at this one first. Notice the slope from the top of the skull above the eye down to the nose. That's the rostral slope here pretty even, doesn't sink in much here. Let's look at this other one. All right, we have a pretty big dip right in there. That's pretty typical of many of our dog breeds, whereas this is from a wild dog, a canid called a coyote. I'm sure some of you all have heard them around uh, in your neck of the woods. So oftentimes dog skulls and, and the coyote skulls are difficult to distinguish if the dog is an animal like a collie or German Shepherd, but you will see in most breeds of dogs, you'll see this dip here in the front. And that's from years and years of breeding the dog so that it looks less and less like its wild ancestor, uh, the gray wolf. <clears throat> On down some more carnivores. Our uh, next size carnivore in West Virginia from the coyote by the way, the coyote uh, was not native here, but it moved in on its own. It wasn't stocked by the DNR, despite the rumors going around. It moved in on its own and filled a niche that the, the eastern wolf used to fill once they were extirpated from the area. So we see the canine teeth here. We see some carnassials. And uh, this skull looks a lot like the coyote skull in many ways, but it's much smaller. We'll compare it to this one, which is even uh, smaller still. And what you'll notice is that there is a very distinct ridge on this skull, which I'll point out to you. Can you whoop, my finger's in the way. Can you see that ridge there? It's very distinct. It's lyre shaped upside down. Now here it's like a like a lyre, like a a musical instrument that the, the Greeks and the other folks in the Mediterranean region used to play. And then on this one, which is a similar animal, but it doesn't have a prominent ridge there. So we have a red fox and we have a gray fox. The gray fox is the one with the prominent ridge. On down through the carnivores, we have a cat. This is a small bobcat skull. And notice compared to the fox, how short the nose is on the cat. And the eyes are even further towards the front of the face than on the, on the fox. <clears throat> Another carnivore we have in West Virginia looks a little bit like a cat, except the cat's rostrum is Cat's nose is not as long. This animal's nose is not as long as the fox. So what we have here is a raccoon. And uh, typically they have kind of a, um, a convex appearance to 
their skull from the eyes down to the teeth. You get into the skunks and the weasels and they, they all typically have long, narrow skulls like this one here, put it back, you can see how small it is. This is a skunk, long and narrow, with a nice pinch in the middle there. Now I'm gonna get an animal that has, has um, canine teeth, but look at the brain case compared to, say, gray fox very tiny brain case can you guess which animal this might be it's an animal that its intelligence doesn't allow it to get away from cars very often so this is a possum skull and they often get squished on the road i'm not saying they're not smart i'm just saying they start out with a they start out life with a smaller brain and so maybe they just don't have enough time to catch up with the foxes now let's go to the rodents real quick. Largest rodent, largest native rodent in North America. It's the beaver. Now look at this skull. Let's compare this to one of the one of the uh, carnivore skulls. You'll notice that where the carnivore has these teeth all the way from the carnassials forward to the canine tooth and onto the incisors. This beaver has teeth here. See the teeth, the sockets for the teeth. And then there's this huge gap called a diastema. And then we have two big incisors in the front. Typical of all rodents to have some molars here, a big gap, and some, some incisors, pronounced incisors at the front of the skull. <clears throat> so this is a beaver. Another one of our rodents by size. You can compare it with the beaver. It's the next step down in West Virginia, and that's the groundhog or the whistle pig. Slight differences in the skull to give you some ideas of how to distinguish them in the field, but we're not gonna go over all the details that we could today because we're gonna run out of time. Next rodent down, another aquatic like a beaver. This is a muskrat skull. Again, see the, the pronounced incisors, line of molars and the gap in between them, the diastema. Got a squirrel here with a rubber band around his jaw. You can see those incisors. That would put a hurting on you if you tried to feed that squirrel nut and he decided to bite you. And now, sometimes when you're in the woods, you find bones and can't tell what they are. The more you learn about what the animals do with their teeth, and how they eat and what they eat, the more you can understand uh, how to distinguish even if you have small parts of bones. For instance, found this skull here, all right? And it had a little bit of jawbone left. And the front of the skull, the upper part of the jawbone, jaw was gone. So I couldn't count any incisors there or anything at all, but I could tell that there was a diastema. There was, here's the sockets for the teeth, the molars, and then you go forward and there's a gap, no sockets. On the lower jaw, it's going to be hard to see, but get it up close to you. <clears throat> You'll notice there's an incisor, and then behind the incisor is another hole for another tooth to distinguish between rodents and rabbits or hares. We look for how many incisors they have in each jaw. Rodents have two incisors in each jaw. Legomorphs, rabbits, hares, they have four incisors in each jaw. They have two pair of incisors, a large pair out front and a tiny pair behind, which seems to give support to the, the uh, pair out front. So if you know that difference between those particular um, animals, you can, actually they're in different uh, orders, you can tell whether you have a uh, squirrel skull or whether you have a small rabbit skull in hand. All right, a little bit about fur. <clears throat> okay.
I imagine all of you all have seen deer. But if you've really paid close attention to the deer, you'll know that right now they have what's called a gray coat. It's brown, but it's kind of a grayish brown. Later on, they're going to shed that coat and it's going to become kind of reddish. So the adult deers go from having a gray coat in the wintertime, the cold season, to having a reddish brown coat in the warm season. But what about when they start out life? They're spotted. And there's a reason for that. They're uh, one of their enemies, uh, one of their uh, predators, let's say, coyotes, and their former predators, wolves, cannot see color. So it doesn't matter if these spots are white and white on a green background or yellow on a purple background. The, the thing that hides this coat of this fawn deer from a coyote or a wolf is the dappled light in a forest environment. So that to you and I, this stands out. You see kind of a reddish brown coat and white spots everywhere. I should say to you and me. But to a wolf or a coyote, they only see light and dark, light and dark pattern. And if you've ever been in the woods when the sunlight is coming down through the trees, you see little spots of white on the forest floor, just like the spots on a fawn, a fawn deer's coat. So the, the coats of the animals, the pelage of the animals, tell us a little something about how the animals survive or about um, what season of the year it happens to be in. <clears throat> now I've been talking a lot about coyotes. Here's a, here's a big old coyote pelt. This is a winter coyote pelt. How do I know? Because the hair is super thick. And with all the animals in West Virginia that stay outside through the course of the wintertime, their second coat, their cold season coat, is always much thicker than their summer season coat. Uh, that bear hide that I had on initially was a, a winter season bear kill. But uh, I, I once tanned the hide of a bear. It was almost a 400 pound bear, but it was hit by a car in August. And the, the, the hair was super thin on that. Glad you all are patient and bearing with me as I move about. Of course, you saw this little rascal earlier. This is a red fox. Look at the coat, the coloration of the back of the animal here. And this is aptly named a gray fox. Now, sometimes gray foxes have a significant amount of red coloration, reddish brown on them. You can see up around the neck, the nape area, around the belly, and sometimes even on the back, it's kind of reddish. But in West Virginia, our red foxes are always much more reddish brown or orange brown than the gray foxes. And there's another little trick. Look at the tips of the tails. The, the red fox, even when the red fox happens to have black fur, I've never seen that in West Virginia, but in some parts of the world it happens. They always have a whitish tip tail, whereas the gray fox typically has brown and black on the tip of the tail. No matter how much variety there is in the color of the rest of their pelage, their tail is almost always brownish and blackish, whereas the red fox will always have a white tip on the tail. Now, one of you are going to see a red fox with no white tip, and you're going to say, you lied to me. And I'm going to say, that's biology. <laughs> Sometimes mutations happen and so on and so forth. <laughs> now, this is a, an animal that's done well in West Virginia in recent years. Bobcats have been doing pretty well in the state. Um, main thing I want to point out with a bobcat skin is that the spotting we often associate with bobcats doesn't extend typically on the back. Now on a very young, a kitten, it might be spotted on the back, but on your typical adult bobcat, the spotting is mostly on the belly and on the legs. See that there. Again, that, that happens to work towards camouflage of this uh, animal. And these are top predators, uh, so they need to be hidden from their prey animals as well. Bobcats are one of the few animals that, get, that are effective at taking turkeys. Because turkeys see in color, so they not only can detect movement, 
they can detect color differences too. So bobcats have to be super stealthy in order to be able to uh, take the turkeys down. How are you doing on time, Kevin? We're good. I was muted myself. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we've got about five. Okay. Minutes left, Doug. Okay, good. <clears throat> I wanted to go over some of the more common ones that folks tend to see or smell. <clears throat> Striped skunk. We have two skunks in West Virginia. Don't know if you all knew that. One of them is fairly rare um, animal, especially west of the Alleghenies, but we're starting to see more of them in, in the west, west of the Alleghenies. So uh, those of you who live in Pocahontas, uh, Greenbrier, Monroe County, start looking for the, the spotted skunk. I don't have an example, but instead of a stripe, they'll have kind of wavy worm-like pattern on their back. Um, this is also a striped skunk, just like this is a striped skunk, but this one has no stripe and they vary quite a bit. I've seen some that had no white whatsoever, not even on their head, but uh, oftentimes you'll find a skunk that is mostly black with a little bit of white on the head. Sometimes the stripes only go part way down the back. <clears throat> They're gonna have the skulls, the long narrow skull, like I showed you here. <clears throat> Here's the possum. I know I was kind of making fun of the possum, but a naked tail. This tells us this animal probably originated further south. Well, we know it did. It originated further south where the weather was warmer. As it goes northward, and it has been moving northward, now, they're now even as far north as Ontario, uh, their tails tend to freeze off in the wintertime. Tips of the tails freeze off. So that tells us this is a southern animal that has not long been in the northern reaches of its range. Nice, uh, interesting. I think it's a beautiful coat. Uh, stippled white and black, uh, sort of like me. So that's why I think so much of this little guy. And then another one that you'll see a lot, the masked bandit. The raccoon has this dark mask. Raccoon's pelage can, can, it can vary from almost white. Sometimes uh, people uh, go coon hunting and they bring back what they call a blonde coon. It's almost a very yellowish color animal. And sometimes, especially the further north you go, they can almost be black. And of course, the ring tail is distinctive, no matter whether they're a blonde coon or a black coon or just a regular coon, that's going to be pretty distinctive to see the black and light colored pattern of the tail. And remember, this is our raccoon skull, sort of a con convex uh, slope from the above the eyes down to the tip of the nose. <clears throat> We have a few aquatic mammals in West Virginia. Some are rodents, some are uh, carnivores. This little guy here, a naked tail like a possum, usually roundish, usually kind of a chocolate brown or a chestnut brown on the upper side, paler underneath. This is a muskrat. Muskrats and Beavers, this is a small beaver pelt. They look kind of similar. The fur feels totally different. And of course, the beaver has the very noted flat uh, spatula shaped tail, which it, it uses for a variety of purposes. This tail comes in handy slapping mud and patting mud down on their dens as they build their dens and their dams. It's also handy for making a loud noise when they are trying to scare off a predator at the water's edge, when they dive down and slap the tail on the water. If you ever get a chance to see and hear that, it can be pretty loud, almost like the crack of a small gunfire. <clears throat> now, I don't have a whole otter skin, but I do have an otter, part of an otter made into a, an 18th century style American Indian pouch for carrying things around. But uh, there is a difference between the otter and the beaver in their skin. The otters, guard hairs are shorter and softer than the guard hairs of a beaver. And what I mean by guard hairs, those are kind of stiff hairs that lay over top of what's called the beaver down or the beaver wool underneath. A little hard to see here, but if I spread this out, I think you can 
tell there's some real soft down under there. But if you just look at the at the animal skin like this, you're seeing primarily the guard hairs over top of that down. And the otter's guard hairs are very short. They do have a really thick under fur that's very short guard hairs. And they have oily glands on their legs that they, they will take, uh, the beavers do, they'll take the oil from the um, near the base of their tail and put it all over their body to oil down the, the uh, hairs and make them a little more water resistant. <laughs> All right, now if we have time, I've got a couple extra things uh, to go over if we've got time. Sure, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew it's 1.30 and you're welcome to stick with us. We are recording this, so if you want to catch up on the rest of it um, later, we'll send that out to you on Monday morning. But please stick with us if you have the time. It looked like Kimberly Crager had her hand up. I don't know if, she's, if she still does. Ms. Did anybody have a question? I have a question that um, someone had asked me to ask you, um, and uh, yeah, let's take time for that. Uh, you have uh, you sort of answered it, and I just was curious uh, why are bobcats doing so well? I've only seen a couple in my lifetime that I think that I think I recognize right, and uh, I was just curious about that. Well, the the folks who study them think they're doing so well because they have plenty of game animals to eat. Our game, most of our small game animal populations are doing really well. We've had a lot of um, farms have turned, uh, reverted to forest land and shrub land, which is typically good for a lot of small mammals. And that then benefits the, the bobcats as well. Plus there aren't as many people hunting bobcats as they used to. Back in the 1930s and 40s, there were actually contests, what they called varmint contests, where um, people were paid prizes to go out and kill as many predatory animals as they could. And bobcats suffered a great deal during that period. And ever since that time, they've been making a comeback. I see Kimberly's hand up again. <laughs> Kimberly, it's great that you have your hand up. I don't know that I can uh, unmute you right now, but if you want to send your question by email, I don't know if you can do that. We can, uh, we can ask it for you. Um, let me show you a couple other things then those who want to stick around. And if I can't answer this question, Chris King can. <laughs> These questions. It's a poke at Chris. She's a she's a friend of mine. Sometimes we we find bones in the woods and we wonder, well, what what's happened? Why why is this animal dead? Um, sometimes there's evidence of why the animal is dead. I want you to look closely at this. This is the short rib area of the vertebra of a cow. Look at this side here. Look at this side here. Notice on this side, we have these bumps where bone has grown over the gap between the different vertebra. That's arthritis. That's a, a, a bad case of arthritis. So this tells us this was probably a very old cow. We don't know that the arthritis killed the cow, but the arthritis certainly slowed the cow down, caused the cow pain, and could have potentially uh, impact of the cow's uh, living conditions. <clears throat> and here is a cow skull. Can you see it? I hope you can. Notice no holes for incisors on the upper part, upper jaw. Now let's compare that to something we sometimes see with cows in a field, a pasture, horse. Notice the upper jaw incisor holes. So there's a big difference in the mouth parts of a cow and horse. And you can probably tell what happened to this horse. First of all, we look at the holes for the teeth there. And you'll notice there's a, it almost looks like um, foam. You know, the bones all kind of broken up into little pockets. And I'm talking like in between the teeth. That's an indication that this, this animal's body was stealing calcium from around the, uh, the 
teeth, the teeth area. So this is an old animal. And then we can see that this animal died from lead poisoning. In other words, somebody shot this animal. So that again tells me that this horse was probably an old horse, probably not doing very well. And uh, the, the best that could be done for this horse was to put it out of its aging mis misery. Don't tell my wife that. Okay. Um, Doug, um, the when feral answer, uh, uh, Kimberly wrote an email, said that, uh, would she find any of these animals near her home in Proctorville, Ohio? Uh, yes, she could. Um, most of them that I mentioned she could find in Proctorville in that area. Um, I'm sure she, there are deer there. I would say almost every animal that I've mentioned, she would be able to find there. Proctorville, not far from the Ohio River. There are beavers in the Ohio River. There are otters in the Ohio River now. There have been muskrats in the Ohio River since the, the beginning of time, basically. They never were extirpated from the Ohio River. The beavers were, were mostly gone by the uh, late 1800s, 1880s, uh, 1890s. But the, uh, and the otters were gone too. They'd been trapped out and pollution was so getting so bad at that time. But uh, both of those animals made a comeback, partly through restocking. So she could find those three aquatic species definitely in uh, the Proctorville area. And almost every one of the other animals that I've mentioned, she could find there, probably all of them, I imagine. <clears throat> this is a pig skull. And as I mentioned, we have feral pigs. I don't know if there are feral pigs in Proctorville, but we have them in, in Southern West Virginia. Some of them are pretty close to being the um, wild boar, the genetically they're, they're very, they're close to being the original stock of Russian wild boar, but we also have an admixture of some uh, tame hog mixed in with the wild boar. So they do have um, these teeth that look a lot like canines. Uh, they're called tusks uh, because they're on a pig instead of on a dog or a cat, they're called tusks. And uh, this is this is one with small tusks. Some of these tusks, especially on the the big male boar bears or boar hogs, can get really big. And the other feral animal that we have in West Virginia, and I think there are some in uh, parts of Ohio, some feral goats. Um, this one here is a goat skull, and we'll talk a little bit about the difference between a horn and an antler. See, on this goat skull. This is a nice thick bone that underlies the, um, the horn covering, which is made, uh, I believe, of uh, uh, hair. It's a concentration of hair that is on top of the bone. And it never goes away unless the animal dies and it rots off. That was the case with this one. The outer covering, the sheath, the horn, uh, rotted off, but the bony structure remained. Remember what I said about the deer? Every year, the antlers come off on a deer. So that's the difference between an antler and a horn. Plus, the antler never has a thick hair, hair like or hair made sheath. It has a very thin skin and it even has fuzz on the skin while the antler is growing. And just immediately underneath that skin are veins and they supply veins and arteries supplying and taking away uh, from the antler, taking away waste product as the cells grow and applying calcium and other minerals to make the bone of the antler. But at the end of the growing season, then they start to decay around the base and an abscission layer is formed and they fall off in late winter. With the animals that have horns, they don't fall off. <clears throat> All right, I'll return to this since we still have a group of people, it uh, looks like, on there. Which is, which is front and which is hind? Well, do you notice any difference at all? That's the first question I guess I should have asked. The difference I see is that looking at the space between the, the back end of the toe 
and what's called a dew claw. You see how much space is in there? A little bit over a finger's width. But if you look at this one, there's two fingers widths in there. The hind leg of an ungulate, typically the dew claws are further back from the toe claws when compared to the front foot. Just about a finger's width in there in, in this case, and just about two fingers width in there. So this is the hind and this is the front. Now, uh, there's a similarity <clears throat> in medium size to large predatory, predatory mammals. Also, the front foot of, of a large wolf, let's say, is, has a larger print than the hind foot, foot. And the reason for that is the predators and other animals of that size, typically they need to be able to turn rapidly to catch their prey. And most of the prey species of smaller mammals have large hind feet compared to the front feet. But with the, the need of the predators to be able to turn quickly in order to out maneuver the prey animals, they have larger front feet to catch them when they're going forward so that they can make a sudden turn. So if you look, if you were, and I don't have an example, but if we had the front foot and the hind foot of a, a wolf or a coyote, I could show you that there is a difference. And when you go find tracks in the, the woods, of, even dogs are like this, they reflect their wolf ancestors. Their front foot print is a little bit larger than their hind foot print. With the coyote, the hind print almost reminds me of the pogo stick. It's almost like a little tiny spot that pogos the, the beast forward and the front ones are the ones that take the impact of the animal stopping suddenly in order to turn. So with the deer, it's kind of similar because the front, front toes and dew claws are so close to one another, it essentially gives it a larger pattern for catching itself moving forward. Even these are prey animals, but they're about the size of some of the larger predatory animals. And the back one, the dew claws rarely ever touch the ground. They do sometimes, but rare. Mostly it's just this print here. So it's a smaller print than both of these combined together on the front. <clears throat> that's about all I have. Um, if the, anybody has sent you any questions, Kevin, I'll be glad to try to answer them. But uh, keep in mind that form follows function. So when you're looking at bones, whether they be skulls or leg bones or ribs or whatever, um, they're going to tell you things, give you some clues about the function of those bones and about the morphology of the animal is going to give you some clues to what the animal tends to eat and um, that kind of thing. You know, whether they are predatory, uh, whether they are scavengers, whether they're uh, vegetation eaters, um, that's something that the bones and the skin and other animal parts can tell you about the animal, even when you don't see the actual animal and can't sit around and watch the animal all day long to find out how it eats and what it eats. Doug, uh, there's uh, just one other question, which is how did you um, come about having all of these skulls and skins. <laughs> See the color of my hair? <laughs> I've been collecting since I was a kid. I have uh, quite a few um, quite a few up in the attic uh, that I've been collecting over the years. Um, and I spend a lot of time outdoors and that makes a big difference. And I have, uh, I've always had relatives who were willing to allow me to bring things home, whether it was my mother uh, and father or whether it was my wife or is my wife, they all have been uh, very uh, lenient towards me when I bring home an animal and start processing the hide in order to make an interesting something that I can show other people. So it takes time, it takes time in the woods, it takes time on this planet, and you too can come up with a collection like this. <laughs> 
Well, Doug, thank you so much for your time. I, I always learn something from you and I hope you all did as well. Um, like I said, I'll be sending this out in an email by, uh, by Monday. Um, and please do join us next Friday. We actually have had a schedule switch going on for next Friday, so I can't tell you 100% for sure, but hopefully Monday morning when we send out the recording, you'll know what's coming next Friday. Um, hope you all have a wonderful weekend and take good care of yourselves. Enjoy the outdoors.